if you think about kind of where where we've been, where we're going, um, how many of you would say you have a healthy digestive system? And how many of you doctors out there, you're running the right labs on your patients? And then how many of you could actually, you know, there maybe there's some some better things you could be doing? Because what I want to share real quick is uh, is one of the digestive panels that can be so helpful is the metabolomics. And if you haven't done this, so kid, if you haven't done your blood work, I bet you probably haven't gotten the scoop on your poop yet. Um, it's It's been a while. Know. So uh, this is this is a Genova test. This gives you kind of an overview of everything Dan and I just spoke about. And once again, when, when we go through kind of the foundational rules of peptides, um, there's, there's some principles that you wanna follow. And some of those principles are you've gotta remove interferences and build up deficiencies. And testing is one of the ways we get there. And so um, this is an example of metabolomics. And so uh, with metabolomics, you can see how your digestion's doing from a pancreatic elastase. Are you breaking down your proteins properly? How's your fat metabolism? And for those of you who have tan stools, we typically see that you are not breaking down your, your fats at all. The, the stool test, you can also see inflammatory markers. This is interesting because, uh, you know, what we're going to jump into in a minute here on LL37 is Lyme <coughs> disease. A lot of our patients, I notice their inflammatory markers are really elevated when they've had Lyme or even uh, we've had a few patients who've got uh, deer tick fever, which is, is kind of interesting. Um, and then from this test, uh, Dan, I don't know how you structure yours, but when we see the methane score high, um, that gives us a pretty good indication that we've got um, some issues with SIBO right there. Yeah, for sure. And in a lot of cases, if, if the symptoms and the signs mimic it, then, you know, we don't treat the SIBO directly anymore. We used to throw the elemental diet at them or a faximin. And um, what I found is there's a gentler way of treating it. And that's where like uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide, LL37, uh, along with some detoxification protocols um, and some dietary changes, obviously, help get rid of SIBO without directly attacking it. Because I found with the elemental diet or even rifaximin, the patient would take two steps back, one step forward. And by the time we got done with three protocols, they, they weighed next to nothing. And, and we're just like, we've got to, we've got to redo this. And this was about five years ago, but, but this is one of the scores that we look at. And in some cases we'll want to get very selective. Is it methane? Is it hydrogen? And we'll do the breath test, but this gives us an understanding. We'll look at metabolic imbalance and beta glucuronidase. Um, what, you know, you, you think of beta glucuronidase, like estrogen metabolism, what else do you look at that pathway for, you know, it's functionality wise. Well, it's, it's also, it's clearance of testosterone too. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good indicator of gram negative overgrowth. So, yeah. Yep. And what's interesting is, is, uh, I have patients who are put on hormone replacement therapy and they feel worse on it. I had a patient and he got, he was put on testosterone, at, uh, one of the testosterone clinics and uh, he thought it was just going to change everything and it made everything worse. And then when we ran his gut test, they said, oh, your, your beta glucuronidase pathway is completely blocked. Like you're not, you're not metabolizing anything and you're putting a massive burden on your liver. So no wonder why you felt even worse. So, yeah. So you'll, yeah, it was like a double-edged sword with that marker. Um, with a gram negative increase, you're going to have the LPS. Mm -hmm. that's hitting that liver massively affects the thyroid conversion. And then the, so glucuronidase is glucuronidation is one of the six phase two liver pathways. And, and it's really simple process. It's like, it, you just take um, a glucose molecule it attaches to a hormone, changes it, makes it water soluble, gets out through the kidney and that gram negative bacteria, that beta glucuronidase that actually cuts that it's an enzyme that cuts that sugar molecule off of the hormone so you can't do anything with it so you just recycle it yeah totally yeah and then the final one is uh infection you know so if you if you look at the body uh this is a patient of mine that i thought for sure she had an infection and that was what was driving a lot of her symptoms 
Oh. And then we dive into it. We're like, actually, you don't. You just have inflammation. And it, she was reacting to all the different foods. So we ran a Cyrex uh, food panel on her. And it, um, you know, it showed that, man, she was having massive reactions. And so, um, so once again, don't play guessing games with your health. Testing is, is one of the most critical things. Let's talk about sleep in the gut. So Dan, the HPA axis, you know, we mentioned this earlier, more nerve endings in your gut than your spine, but what are some ways that people can actually test their neurological function? I mean, you've got some pretty nuanced neurological tests that you do, but what's some basic things that people probably could do right now to see if their, their vagal tone is, is uh, healthy? Um, you know, the two things with vagal tone in a simple way is, you know, doing ah and, and seeing the palatine reflex in the back of the throat, you know, if that thing lifts up, but you don't just want to stop there because it's not, most people aren't going to have just straight out vagal dysfunction. Most of these people we're dealing with, like your other patient, they have, they have a metabolic issue and that results in low energy. So you get this, this concept of neuronal fatiguing. So doing the ah, you want to do that 10 times. And you want to see if the palatine reflex gets weaker, weaker, and weaker. Um, and then the the big piece of that also a good a, a good indication of the dopaminergic release of all these digestive secretions is also going to be reflected by the overall health of the oral cavity as far as moisture. You know, is the tongue dry? You know, do do people salivate? Are they getting that amylase or the salivary lipase? Um, you know, that's a really good indication that they're not getting the same like release in their, in their gut, the same digestive secretions, whether it be the, uh, HCL bile acid or pancreatic enzyme. So, um, looking in the mouth and then checking that, that, that reflex and then asking, you know, are you have any issues with choking or swallowing? Um, those are really quick little indicators, you know, because choking or swallowing is motility and that gives you a good idea of intestinal motility. So I'd say those are like really quick windows into the soul of your gut. But one of the peptides that we'd love to use and is one of the very first peptides we use is a peptide called epitalin, or as Dan likes to call it, epitalone. Okay. Well, I guess you don't, you don't really like to call it that, but it's oh, man, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, Cade likes to call it epitalone, right, Cade? Yeah. It needs to have more of like a British accent with it though. A pitch, a pitch alone. <laughs> there we go. A, a pitch alone. There we go. Yes. So um, epitalin is a really phenomenal peptide because, uh, you know, this was originally studied by Dr. Kabasin and it's considered a bioregulator. But one of the fascinating things about epitalin is it works on the pineal gland and, and Dan, there's been so much research on the pineal gland as of late, you know, with DMT and psychedelics and ketamine and all these cool therapies that are opening up the subconscious mind. But uh, when you think of the pineal gland, how, how would you describe it in a way that would help people understand its importance a little, a little deeper? Well, you know, it's, it, I think, one of the most fascinating aspects of it is it has some of the similar cells that are in your eyes. So it's very light sensitive. So it's, you know, even though it's like deep in the brain there, um, you know, it's one of the master regulators of the sleep cycle. It helps us, you know, with our, our waking cycles. And so at, when I, when I'm, you know, describing it or talking about it, I spend more, most of my time um, help people understand that it's, it's the, it's like this master clock that's light sensitive and also gets feedback from the digestive tract. So our sleep and eating cycles that help regulate our biorhythms. Um, but epitalin, what do you know about epitalin, Dan? And, and, uh, kind of some fascinating things you've observed in using this. Mainly, you know, I, the, the, I've had two really good cases with one guy that is, um, it really severe sleep cycle issues. And that's been a massive reset for him. He, was, he had years of being on third shift and getting back on to a normal sleep schedule had been impossible. And it was actually a really good sleep reset for him. Um, and then we had another gentleman that was doing a testosterone 
therapy with us and he did really good. He felt really good when he had HCG, but gonadarellin didn't work. And we did kiss peptin and he noticed nothing. He just felt horrible. Mm. And epitalin like reset that for him, which was really interesting. And it wasn't, it, we, he just had, you know, really bad insomnia. So we thought, you know, we'll, let's see how this works see if we can get him feeling better and that actually was had been the key thing and so it's it's had some massive responses for people yeah and and epitalin i mean if if you think about it it's also known as epithalamin so um same structure um but the beautiful thing about this is um we start everybody on epitalin just because there's so much subconscious stress that that interferes with your body's ability to perform any other actions. And so I look at epitalin as, you know, we've used the orchestra analogy a lot today, but I look at it as the conductor and uh, very powerful. So, I'll, uh, you know, we've got a couple of studies at the bottom here. And so you guys can link on these, but I'm going to share a couple of these with you. Um, I've got good news. Um, you know, Dan, I know your love for fruit flies um, and, and I just, you know, I, I was digging in because I'm like, Dan's got his whole farm of fruit flies. And I wonder if there's a peptide that could help them live a little longer. And um, what they found is this, this pineal peptide, because epitalin, it is a telomerase enzyme that's uh, released from the pineal gland. But they found that um, the mortality rate, all cause mortality was decreased. And in fruit flies, um, you know, it worked, it worked in mice and it worked in rats, but mortality rate was decreased by about 52%. So it's good news, isn't it? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> but why, why, <laughs> why well, fruit flies? Why do we study things like that on fruit flies anyway? Do you, do you know? I, I, I know, I think it has just to do with their life cycle. It's like a quick picture of what a full life cycle looks like in just a short amount of time. Yeah, and, and uh, fruit flies have an interesting, um, they have a cardiac pulse. The way that their uh, cardiovascular system works is very similar to humans. It's like strange. So um, it's a nice, uh, and, and you don't see a lot of environmentalists or, or people like uh, protesting against uh, uh, fruit fly cruelty. I have never seen that on a bottle of shampoo. Like this was not tested on fruit flies, but apparently uh, epitalin was, and they found that they live 52% longer. Um, if you have pet mice, pet rats, they'll live longer as well. Um, so kind of interesting. Here's uh, epitalin. If we look at it, um, some of the, the research also shows that it's cardioprotective. Um, and, and by cardioprotective, if we look at the number one cause of mortality, it still is heart disease. And so if there's one treatment that I think is really powerful um, to mitigate that, it's, it's epitalin. I'll share a couple slides here for everybody. But, uh, but we've got Danny Rasmussen on. And uh, Danny, I don't know if you're at a place where you can chat. But what Danny did is he turned me on to um, a new way of using epitalin in and Dan, have you tried it yet using the bigger dose of epitalin? Not yet. Not yet. It's, it's pretty cool. So Danny, I appreciate that. That's where Go Wellness is, uh, you know, the beautiful thing that you'll learn at these, uh, at the Go Wellness events or master classes like this one is you'll learn that there's, uh, you know, there's innovation going on all the time. But, but uh, Danny turned me on to some uh, newer usages of epitalin where you, instead of doing um, like a smaller dose, or I've, I've, I've looked at research where somebody's in a complete like, um, you know, almost like a bipolar uh, breakdown, or they're in a PTSD mode, and they'll use an entire bottle of like 3000 um micrograms uh, per milligram, uh, they'll use 10 milliliters of that and um, completely reset it. But um, um, okay, no worries, Danny, double, he's, he's doing double duty. So, um, but anyway, Danny uh, turned us on to this idea of using it every three days using um, a, a 10 milligram per milliliter bottle. And uh, typically it's five mLs, but you do it every three days uh, for five cycles and that resets the entire HP axis. 
And so my wife and I did this um, just after Go Wellness, which was the first weekend in December. And then we coupled it with ARA290. And the reason why we use ARA290 is because it helps increase the red blood cells. And we live at a high elevation, um, you know, similar to you, Dan. And so the red blood cells get taxed. And what we notice is it just took the stress right out of our nervous system. And we've been sleeping better than ever. Hey everybody, Reagan Archbald here. I hope you enjoyed the Go Wellness Show and maybe learned a couple things you could apply to your practice. If you're a healthcare entrepreneur who wants to work in an academic think tank with like-minded humans who are just like you, looking to provide better service, better quality of care for your patients, reach us at info at and we're happy to do a free practice analysis for you.